We've all been depressed once or twice in our lifetime. You actually may be depressed while you're watching this video. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment. Let's talk about depression. Let's go. So remember that depression is very, very common. And depression is a mood disorder and it's going to be characterized by a persistent feeling of sadness and of course, loss of interest. We can also refer to depression as major depressive disorder or clinical depression. It is a very common condition. And the greatest risk is actually found that in women, they are at greater risk of developing depression than men do. But of course, men also do suffer from depression. Even those that have a positive family history of depression are at risk of developing depression. Major depressive disorder is going to be uh, characterized by episodes of depressed mood as well as associated loss of interest in some daily activities. Individuals may actually not even acknowledge that they may be depressed or they may be feeling sad. They may express some somatic vague symptoms such as fatigue, headaches, abdominal pains, muscle aches, just to mention a few. And the onset of depression actually can happen at any age. But what we have noticed is that the peak age of incidence is roughly around 20 years. Depression can actually increase the mobility of the patient's with, or rather, it can increase in mortality for patients with other comorbidities such as diabetes, stroke, and cardiovascular disease. Clinical features of depression have sometimes been confused with low mood. Some people may describe a low mood as being depressed, but for someone to actually have a diagnosis of depression, they should have a number of key features that are persistent for at least two weeks. What are some of these clinical features? So I will group them into two criteria using the ICD, which is the criteria that we shall be using in our psychiatry lectures to make a diagnosis. So we have our group A and of course our group B. Group A includes things like persistent low mood, loss of interest or pleasure, which is known as anhedonia, fatigue or lack of energy, which is anergia. And then of course the B will be reduced concentration and attention. You would have reduced self-esteem, self-confidence, ideas of guilt and worthlessness, hopelessness about the future, suicidal thoughts, disturbed sleep, as well as diminished appetite. When someone has two, fe two or more features from A plus two features from B, they may have some impact or this may have some impact on their daily life. You refer to them as having mild depression. If they have two features or more from A plus three features from B, this has some significant impact on their daily life and this is referred to as moderate depression. If they have all the features from A and four or more features from B, this sometimes is impossible for them to get through their daily life. We refer to that as severe depression. And of course, if they have been more than one discrete episode, this tends to be termed recurrent depressive disorder. Clinical features of depression include some psychomotor retardation where an individual may have slowed movements and slowed thinking. They may have agitation, loss of libido, constipation, and amenorrhea, just to mention a few. They may sometimes have these somatic symptoms that I've just mentioned uh, prior in the previous statement. Then, of course, there may be some psychological symptoms of depression, things like continuous low or sadness, low mood or sadness. They may have feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. They may have low self-esteem. They may feel, feel tearful. They may have this feeling of guilt. They may sometimes even feel irritable and intolerant of others. They often have no motivation or interest in things. They find it very difficult to actually make decisions. They may not actually be getting involved in any enjoyment out of their life. Then they may feel anxious. They may feel worried. They may sometimes even have these suicidal thoughts or thoughts of harming themselves. If you're actually experiencing any of the symptoms, please talk to someone and please get help. 
Some physical symptoms include moving slowly, the so-called psychomotor retardation, speaking more slowly than usual, changes in appetite or weight. Usually there is a decrease, but sometimes there may actually be an increase in appetite. You have heard of people that are stress eaters. You may also have constipation, unexplained aches and pains, lack of energy, low sex drive, such as a loss of libido changes in the menstrual cycle, disturbed sleep. They may be actually finding it very difficult to fall asleep at night or they may be waking up very early in the morning or be actually having excessive sleepiness. Some social symptoms include not doing so well at work. They may actually avoid contact with friends, fear of being asked if everything is all right. They may take part in fewer social activities. They may actually neglect their own hobbies or interests and have difficulty in uh, the... Uh, home situation as well as with your family life. The risk factors that have been associated with depression include things like biochemical factors, genetic factors, personality, as well as environmental factors. There are different chemicals in the brain that are referred to as neurotransmitter that uh, actually contribute to depression. We'll talk about more of this in the pathophysiology of depression. Some genetics have been implicated because depression tends to run in families. For example, if one identical twin has depression, there is a 70% chance that the other one will suffer of depression in their lifetime. Then, of course, different personalities are at risk of developing depression. People that generally have a low self-esteem who get easily overwhelmed by stress or generally are feeling pessimistic most of the times or appear to be more likely to, ex to experience depression than any other personality. Then you may also have some environmental factors such as continuous exposure to violence, neglect, abuse, even poverty. We all know that man lack of money makes all of us sad, may actually cause someone to be vulnerable to depression. So what then causes depression? What is the pathophysiology? The exact cause is actually not really known. But what we believe is that there is actually a combination of factors that come into play, different factors, biological factors, genetic factors, environmental, as well as psychosocial factors. Now, the monoamine theory actually postulates that depression is actually going to be resulting from a deficiency of monoamine neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters such as serotonin, norepinephrine, as well as dopamine decrease in the con their concentrations in the brain. So the evidence can actually be seen by the drugs that we use to treat depression. We give antidepressant drugs that exert the therapeutic effect by actually increasing the scatocholamines. You also get uh, a decrease in cerebrospinal fluid levels of 5 hydroxy endolacetic uh, acid, the main metabolite of serotonin, of course, in depressed patients with impulsive as well as suicidal behaviors. We also get an increase in sensitivity of beta adrenergic receptors in the brain. And this has actually been postulated as one of the major pathogenesis in major depressive disorders. Other reported psycho or physiological features include things like an increase in cortisol, as well as the blunted response to thyroid stimulating hormone. And you also have some neurotransmitters such as gamma immunobutyric acid or GABA in short, glutamate or endogenous opiates that may have a role on the onset of depression. It's actually widely accepted and definitely proven the biological model. Um, there's no widely accepted and definitely a proven biological model uh, that's actually been implicated in the pathophysiology of depression. Some psychosocial or life events may include things like multiple adverse child, child experiences, such as trauma, that may put an individual at risk of developing depression later on in their life. Of course, loss of a parent before the age of 11 has been associated with development of depression later on in their life. Some genetics, like I already said, the first degree relative getting depression puts you at risk two to four times more likely that you may develop major depressive disorder. And we already say that the concordance rate of monozygote twins is less than 40% and 10 to 20% in dizygote twins. There are other types of depression out there that you really need to note and these include postnatal depression, which may actually develop in a woman that has just given a baby. This is often treated just like any other type of depression. And common methods include talk therapy or psychotherapy together with antidepressant drugs. You may also have bipolar di disorder, which is also known as manic depression. In this bipolar disorder, there are going to be these spells of both depression as well as excessively high moods, which is referred to as mania. So the depression symptoms are actually quite similar to depress clinical depression or major depressive disorder, but the bouts of mania can actually cause a harmful behavior such as gambling. People may actually go on spending sprees. They may even have unprotected sexual intercourse. 
Another type of depression is known as seasonal affective disorder, which is also referred to as winter depression. This is a type of depression where someone's mood actually fluctuates or changes, and it's usually related with winter. You also have a condition that's known as dysthymia, which is used to describe as long-standing mild depressive syndrome or long-standing mild depressive symptom to be exact. So remember that this is going to be associated with other psychiatric as well as physical illnesses and can actually co-occur with depression as um, a comorbidity and you refer to this as double depression. You also have psychotic depression where depression at its most severe forms actually becomes psychotic depression, what we refer to as depressive psychosis. So the patient may often have worries or perceive um, misdeme misdemeanors that become uh, delusional in intensity. Okay, so the patient may actually believe that they are actually, them or part of them actually is dead, what is referred to as a cotard syndrome. They experience these auditory hallucinations where they are often derogatory in nature. And of course, the suicide rates in these patients is very high. So this psychomotor retardation can, can actually increase to a point where the person can actually sit motionless and they can be mute, what we call as depressive stupor. So often this is very fatal because they may die from dehydration and it's an emergency and we need emergency electroconvulsive therapy. Psychotic depression must, of course, be distinguished from other types of psychosis. And this is based on the presence of other depressive symptoms. And of course, the mood congruity of the delusions as well as the hallucinations, meaning that the delusions and hallucinations will be going hand in hand together with their mood. Another type of depression is known as atypical depression, where some individuals actually, um, some individuals with depression actually have increased sleep, increased appetite. They may even have phobic anxiety. Then you refer to this as atypical depression. It tends to respond better to monoamine inhibitors as opposed to uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You may also have an older classification that was used that you may come across, which is known as reactive and as well as endogenous depression. So this is an outdated classification of depression that divides depression into uh, reactive depression, which is brought about by stressful life events and endogenous depression, which is supposedly occurring from the patient from within and has no clear external cause. So in endogenous depression, it's actually thought that it was actually inherited and it's more responsive to antidepressive therapy and research into this uh, depression has actually shown that such division actually doesn't exist and these terms are actually rarely used now by psychiatrists. You may sometimes have mixed anxiety and depressive disorders. Anxiety symptoms are very, very common in depressive disorders and when these symptoms of both disorders are actually present but uh, not individually sufficient enough to actually help you make a diagnosis of a depressive uh, mood disorder or an anxiety disorder, then we describe this as mixed anxiety and depressive disorder. When it comes to the management of the condition, management could both be non-pharmacological or pharmacological. We'll start with non-pharmacological. The first and foremost thing is, of course, psychotherapy or talk therapy. This is often going to be used along for treatment of mild depression. We, if we're treating moderate to severe depression, we can actually combine psychotherapy with antidepressant medication. So this is just pretty much talk therapy. A, a type of therapy that can be done is cognitive behavioral therapy, which has been actually found to be very, very effective in treating depression. So this is actually going to be focused on the present uh, and the problem and solving the problem. And of course, cognitive behavioral therapy helps the person actually recognize their distorted way of thinking and actually changes these behaviors and the way of thinking. And the psychotherapy actually involves this individual talking to another individual. And this can include things like family, couple therapy that can actually address these issues within close relationships. You may sometimes have group therapy that involves people with similar issues. This can actually be done for depression. Then, of course, in the pharmacological therapy, we want to give drugs, antidepressants such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are going to be actually producing some improvement within the first week or two of their use. And then, of course, the full benefit is going to be seen two to three months of the patient using the drug. So if a patient actually feels little or no improvement after several weeks, then the doctor can actually out of the dosage of the drug or actually substitute or add another drug. So in some situations, um, other psych psychotropic medication may actually be helpful. Another way in which we manage, especially the emergencies or severe major depression or bipolar disorder, which doesn't actually respond to therapy and is actually a danger to the patient's life is through electroconvulsive therapy. 
it actually is going to be involving a brief electrical stimulation that's going to be passed in the brain. And of course, the patient is going to be under anesthesia. Don't think of those Frankenstein movies where you have someone strapped to a bench and they pass electricity in their brain. It's a, a bit more advanced than that at this point. So a patient is actually going to typically receive about two or three times a week of electroconvulsive therapy for about a total of six to 12 treatments. So this electroconvulsive therapy was actually used as early as 1940 and for many years of research has actually led to major improvements in the field and we now use it by trained medical per, uh, professionals such as psychiatrists, anesthesiologists, even nurses, clinical officers and medical licentiates. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this review lecture video on depression. If you know someone who's depressed, who's depressed, please reach out to them, help them out. If you are depressed, please reach out and let's interact. Leave a comment in the section below, drop a like, share the video if you may. I hope you learned so much. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevo.